We'll get into Romans chapter 7 in just a few moments, but of course we want to begin this morning with a word of prayer. If you will bow with me, please. Our great Father who is in heaven, we are in awe of you and your amazing power and nature. You are perfectly good, perfectly holy, perfectly just. You are the very essence of love. And we want to to quiet our spirits and calm our hearts this morning and appreciate what it is that we're doing and who it is that we are talking to. We are completely unworthy of addressing you this morning. But we are so full of thanksgiving that by the blood of your Son, you have invited us boldly to come before your throne of amazing grace. Father, help our hearts to clear away all of the the clutter and distractions that would prompt us to take this great privilege for granted. Help us throughout this week to appreciate the incredible privilege of prayer and to be people of prayer, to be people who understand and, and feel deep in our hearts both the great privilege of prayer and and our desperate need for you each and every hour. Thank you for being so faithful to us. Thank you for taking such good care for us. Even when we leave you out of our thinking, even when we lay down to sleep, we know that you are, are perfectly in control and you have always been faithful to us. Help us to be motivated by that, to investigate our own hearts and determine by the strength that you supply to be faithful to you as well. Thank you for your word that informs so many of these great truths for our minds. Help our minds to be renewed and and help us to present ourselves today and, and this week and for the remainder of our lives as living sacrifices to you. Father, help us to appreciate what we're doing here today. Help our hearts to express thanksgiving and praise to you throughout this day. We pray that we would be built up, be with all who are studying and teaching throughout this building this morning. Our hearts are full of thanksgiving because we offer our prayers and our supplications to you in the name of your risen Son and our Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 7 is where we are this morning. One more time, if you did not get material, we've got it just outside of the doors there. We're on page 43. We are in week number 12 in our two-quarter study of the book of Romans. By the time that we're done this morning, we will have reached the halfway point of that study, and we're glad that you have joined us. If you were here last Sunday morning, you know that even though Paul leads us through at times very deep waters in the book of Romans, at the end of Romans chapter 6, he has brought us to a very very simple, very straightforward fork in the road. In the language of Peter, the apostle, there are some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand and and we're challenged by that and our understanding is deepened by that. But he's got this uh, amazing ability by the Spirit of God at times to lead us out of that deep water and to just in a few words paint for us the most simple of choices. And that's where we left off at the end of what we have as Romans chapter 6. This fork in the road where we recognize, I will present myself as an obedient slave. Either, first of all, to sin. And Paul has charted for us where that's going to lead. Sin will lead us in pathways of impurity. Lawlessness will only lead to more lawlessness. And there is no mystery as to the ultimate destination of that pathway. That pathway leads to death. I will present myself as an obedient slave either to sin 
or to obedience. I will present myself as an obedient slave to God. This will lead me in the pathways of righteousness. This will result in what Paul describes as sanctification. I will grow more and more and more to be holy as God is holy. And the end of that pathway, as he tells us at the end of Romans chapter 6, is eternal life. It is either or. You look at Romans chapter 7. That's our text for this morning. You might need to turn a page before and and begin reading with me in Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Paul uses two figures to illustrate a foundational principle. Okay, we ran across the first figure last Sunday morning. We're going to go into the second figure at the beginning of Romans chapter 7. Here is the foundational principle. Romans 6 verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace by no means. There is the foundational principle. And to illustrate that, first of all, he used the figure of slavery. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Foundational principle, verses 14 and 15. Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Now let's illustrate that. And throughout the rest of Romans chapter 6, he used slavery as an example of the the basic principle that uh, he wrote about in the middle of Romans chapter 6. We turn our attention fully this morning to Romans chapter 7, and we run across the second illustration. Are we to sin? By no means. Figure of slavery as an example. Number one, now the institution of marriage as a second example. Read with me the first three verses of Romans chapter 7. Or... Taking us back to, we, we've just talked about something, now here's a, a, another building block on top of that. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now, we understand... Hopefully, we're going to try our best to remember that what we're doing in this particular class, this quarter and the next quarter, is a textual study of the book of Romans. And we could launch into several weeks worth of talking about what we can learn concerning the nature of marriage from Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. We don't want to skip over that. We, we want to talk about it here for just a moment. But we want to appreciate where this is falling and the way that it is being used by the Apostle Paul. This is an example to illustrate the foundational principle we as Christians should not continue to sin. Okay, And he's using a variety of different figures to illustrate that principle. But before we go any further, even just these three verses are informative for us concerning the nature of marriage. We'll talk about the figure in just a minute and how it relates to our relationship with God and the relationship with the law and everything. But before we go any further, these are, are... breathed out words by God concerning the nature of marriage itself. What can we learn from just those three verses in Romans chapter 7, specifically about the nature of marriage? Nancy, go ahead. It's not one of those things that today you see so much of. These young people get married. You know, you don't make me happy. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. The phrase no-fault divorce didn't originate in the Scriptures. 
We appreciate that, right? Any time divorce is involved, sin is somewhere in that equation. Each and every time, okay? One way or another. Good observation. Other thoughts, other things that we can learn. David? I think the basic principle of one woman, one man for life. Yeah. This takes us all the way back to as it was in the beginning. You, you know, Jesus also did that. In Matthew chapter 5, in Matthew chapter 19, he addresses many of the traditions of the Pharisees. He addresses what God through Moses allowed the children of Israel to do because of their hardness of heart. But he takes us all the way back to Adam and Eve and reminds us of God's intention as it was from the very beginning. One man and one woman for life. Gordon and then Alan. There's uh, some people who contend that you commit adultery just the first time, but after that, <clears throat> it's not adultery. But right. verse, three, verse 3 don't bear that out. It's Absolutely. Under the gospel, if she lives with another man, mm-hmm. our husband is alive. Right. Adultery is not just a one-time act that I commit with someone and then, well, if I stay with them, I might as well because, you know, we've already committed this sin, but now as long as we love each other, it's not a sin. No, it, it is very clear that as long as that husband is alive, as long as that original design of one man and one woman for life, as long as death has not separated them, once again, sin is going to be involved somewhere in this picture. Alan, go ahead. This is interesting. This uh, scripture here in Romans talks about the law of sin. Mm-hmm. But remember, the Mosaic law was sin and death. Then we have the Mosaic law which is the, the law that we speak of. Mm-hmm. Then it comes Christ. Right. And now we can be relieved of the sin. But God put a, a no do on this. Sure. Sure. Paul has talked a great deal about the principle of law in general. He's talked about the law of Moses, and he has shown us how the law imprisons us all under sin, right? Because not one of us can be justified before God via the avenue of law. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Now, Paul is building, of course, to one of the most wonderfully victorious, triumphant chapters in all of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, right? He's going to begin Romans chapter 8 by exclaiming, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But again, let's appreciate the context. He's trying to illustrate this foundational principle. Are we to sin because we have come in contact with the grace of God? By no means. Okay? Outside of sin, in Christ, there is no condemnation. But most certainly we have seen throughout this letter, and we will continue to see, that even though I might think that God and I are on pretty good terms... I had better be sure that those terms have been defined by God himself and not by my own imagination. Look with me at the bottom of page 43 in our material. Of course, there are other things that we could talk about from those first three verses. While our grasp on the nature of marriage can certainly be enhanced from Paul's illustration, it's important to remember that it is an illustration to make a point within a much larger context, okay? If you are a Christian, the principle reflected upon in Romans 7 verses 1 through 3 applies to your heavenly Father's expectation that now you would walk in newness of life. Illustration 1 was slave. Whoever you present yourself as an obedient slave to, you are the slave of the one you obey, okay? That's illustration number one of the foundational principle. Here's illustration number two. Do you not know, brothers, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, 
But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Okay, there's a, a, an illustration. What does it mean? Especially in the context of Romans. How does this relate to, if you're a Christian, don't buy into the idea that now that we have found grace, we can just continue to dabble in sin. Well, here's where the connections begin to be drawn. In Romans 7 and verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, having talked about God's institution of marriage. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now, we get the sense that something profound is being said here. Let's make sure that we appreciate uh, just how profound it is. If you've got your material and you look with me in the middle of page 44, maybe th this visual breakdown. I don't know about you. I'm a very, very visual learner. Uh, this sort of thing helps me. It's too big for me to put on the screen. And so I would encourage you to look at it uh, on the material. And one more time, if you didn't get a copy of the material, it's just right outside the doors there. Let's take the time to appreciate this God-breathed parallel. Here's the principle. The law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Left column, we've got a married woman. She's bound by law to her husband while he lives. If her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. She will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Which leads us to this bottom line. If her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now, there are things that we can learn about marriage from that. But it's an illustration of a bigger point. Well, what's the bigger point? That's in verses 4, 5, and 6. Let's look at the parallel column. You also, my brothers... On the one hand, we have the married woman who was bound by law to her husband while he lives. You also, my brothers, our sinful passions. It's interesting how in these few verses, Paul switches pronouns back and forth, back and forth. He's talking particularly to Jews, to those who know the law, but he's also frequently sprinkling in the pronoun our. This is Paul's problem as well. Our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. We had a relationship with the old law of Moses. We were bound to that law. Jews had entered into a covenant relationship with God built on the law of Moses and they were bound to that law. What's the big problem with being bound to that law? Even though I am a descendant of Abraham, even though I have been circumcised, what's the problem, Dwayne? So, you know, Paul's trying to reason with them that when a husband dies, you're no longer married to your spouse. In the same way, Christ has now died, so the law of Abraham, the law of Moses, is, is now no longer. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. trying to reason with them that that law is, is no longer a binding law. You're no longer a Okay, yeah, that's going to be the bottom line that we eventually get to. Even before we get to that, the big problem is I'm bound to this law and I've broken it. There's the big problem, right? Even though I have Abraham in my family tree, Jesus reasoned, listen, God can raise descendants for, uh, from Abraham from these stones, right? Don't take too much pride in that. 
God used that family line for a reason, okay? And now I I just can't go back on that and say it's all all right because of who's in my family tree. I can't say, well, I have been circumcised and there are all of these other Gentiles who haven't been circumcised and somehow that physical circumcision makes me better. Well, I can't reason like that when I've broken the law and rely on physical circumcision to justify my having broken the law. No, the, the, the basic problem is I'm bound to this law and I've broken it. And so according to the law, what do I deserve? Death. Death. Big problem, right? Let, let's look at the second row. A uh, married woman bound by law to her husband while he lives. If her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. In the other corner, or the other column, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. Now, how in the world did these Christians die to the law through the body of Christ? How did that happen? Okay. Baptism built on faith in Jesus Christ, right? Alan, that what you were going to say? Yeah. I, I mean, ever since Romans chapter 3 and through Romans 4 and Romans 5, he's talked about the importance of faith in Jesus. I cannot justify myself, but God has provided an atoning sacrifice for me. And if I believe that and am willing to respond to that, and in the language of Romans chapter 6, be buried with him in baptism, now I can freely belong to someone else. Okay, before I was bound to the law and it was a really bad situation because I was bound to it, I was accountable to it, but I broke it. And it says rightly and justly, I deserve to die. God intervenes, a death has occurred so that I don't have to bear the penalty for my sin. And now, as I die with Christ, I'm not only dying to my sins, but in this context with the Jews, they're dying to that law in order to be joined to someone else. Let's look at row number three. The married woman will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But that doesn't apply to us as Christians. We are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. Finally, row number four. If her husband dies, that married woman, she is free from that law. If she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So also, you belong to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God and serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now let's particularly think about that for a moment. What does this say to the Jew who would go into the Gentile world and say, yes, you can be a Christian, but you also must be circumcised. Or, yes, you can be a Christian, but you must keep the Sabbath ordinances. Or, you can be a Christian, but you must observe the dietary restrictions that Moses handed down in the law. I didn't come up with those on my own. All of those come from the book of Acts. That's what certain Jews were saying to Gentiles. What does this, how does this serve as a response to that? Again, it's saying they're released. I mean, you just read the sentence. They're released from the law, and it's a new way of the Spirit, not the way of the Spirit. Okay. So it's saying the old law no longer has any effect. There's something new, there's something better, there's something more perfect that has replaced it. Yeah. So we don't have the authority to bind on anybody anything that was in the old. Yeah. For me, as a Jew, to go into the Gentile world and to come to you as a Gentile man or, or woman and say, listen, Yes, you can be a Christian, but you also must do X, Y, and Z from the law. That is just as out of harmony with God's will as saying, 
yes, your husband died, but, but you, you can be married to another man, but you've also got to do X, Y, and Z for your old husband who's dead. Well, how are you going to do that? That doesn't work very well, does it? There aren't very many things that you can do for your husband who has died. There aren't very many expectations that you can meet for your first husband who is dead, right? No, he has died and that has passed away. And now you belong to another. And even though in in some respects this is a, a little foreign to us, this was an enormous deal in the first century. And if you uh, don't really have a sense of that, you need to read the book of Acts because the book of Acts will make very, very clear just how big of a deal this is. Paul is driving to, you can keep your marker there. Let's remind ourselves of what he says in Galatians chapter three. We've noted throughout this study that the book of Galatians is kind of a Cliff Notes version of the book of Romans. Not exactly, but uh, in many respects, the arguments that are made much more detailed in the book of Romans are summed up much more simply and concisely in Galatians. This is the news that he's spreading in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23. Galatians 3, 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive. Same verb that he used in Romans chapter 7. Captive under the law. Imprisoned. Because we broke the law. Until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until... Christ came in order that we might be justified not by the old way of the written code, to borrow his phrase in Romans 7 and verse 6, but justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. That is Romans 7, 1 through 6. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to to promise. Any other thoughts on that before we push on here? Alan, go ahead. In other words, you're saying that Christians are free from the Mosaic law and now enjoy a new life in the Spirit. I would suggest to you that's what Paul is saying. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that is the argument that Paul is making. If you are a Jew and you are relying on ordinances of the old law of Moses in order to be reconciled to God, you can't do that anymore. That law, to borrow the argument of the book of Hebrews, has passed away. It has been nailed to the cross. In addition to that, if you are a Jew and you are trying to bind these things on your Gentile brethren, you are completely out of line. And he's going to make that argument in much more detail in Romans chapter 14. And that's what he means when he says back in the last chapter, sanctification. Right, right. Now, male or female, Jew or Gentile, there is a pathway of sanctification through faith in Jesus Christ. Why can't people get that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> a good question. People have been struggling with that since the days of Jesus, right? Uh, people have been struggling with that through the days of the Apostle Paul. People continue, of course, to struggle with that. Our responsibility, of course, is to try and remain very humble, very receptive to make sure that this is shaping our conception of who we are and who God is, and then do our best to try and help other people. What then shall we say? Okay. Let's appreciate where all of this is coming. We noted the foundational principle in the middle of Romans 6. Now that we have found grace, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Let's illustrate that by talking about slavery. Let's illustrate that by talking about marriage. Okay? And now, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Problem wasn't with the law. 
Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet, but sin. Now let me, let me just kind of give you a, a, a marker here for where we are this morning. Very intentionally, uh, we spend a good amount of time in the first seven verses trying to appreciate that foundational point. What I'm going to do in our last two or three minutes together is read with you this passage of Scripture, and then we're going to talk even a little bit more about it in our assembly time together here in just a little while, okay? But in the context that we've tried to appreciate, read this with me, beginning in verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. A very vivid description of, I once was innocent, I came to understand what the law says, I broke the law, I died, and sin came alive. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin. Producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it a law, to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Massive, massive problem unless God intervenes. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord that there is another way, that that way defined in the right column of our our graphic from earlier. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin.